So good morning. It's challenging with so much talent, so much information going on in so many rooms here. That, and I'm very happy that you're here. Uh, this is very, a, a very attractive subject because in my first job interview, I worked at a company that doesn't exist anymore, Arthur Anderson. I went to talk to my boss and there was a sign on his table. If you don't sell, a terrible thing happens. And you had to get really, really, really close to see what was the terrible thing. And it said, nothing. So unless you sell, unless you can go put your product into market, there's no point in uh, having a product. We are not here in the business of uh, uh, self-fulfillment. Uh, we want to transform our activities in, into money. And uh, naturally, the, so we didn't test it. The first uh, market that we want to go to is the United States. Honestly, if I had a choice, I would rather go to China first. 1.6 billion people, a lot of uh, money going on, a lot of activity, but that's a monopolistic state. It's hard. The moment you're successful there, they shut you off and they let a Chinese company take the, the leadership and copy your product. So we might want to go to the second best market in the world, which is the United States. The United States, you can say horrible things about that, and I'll be the first and I will agree with you, but uh, the economy of the United States is still much bigger than the sum of the next four economies. You can put China, Japan, Germany, and still the United States, from an economic standpoint, it's much bigger. What I want to share with you is my personal experience. I'm originally from Brazil. I owned a company in Brazil. I sold it to an American company. And even if I didn't have any sales background, uh, when I moved to the United States, the CEO of the company put, in, put me in charge of managing sales. So I had to have a crash course. Uh, the company was Berlitz, a uh, global language services company. And uh, I had a group of 40 salespeople uh, working for me. And the first thing, selling, we come from, I don't know, most of you here, Latin cultures, and uh, selling in Latin environments is usually almost a sin. You don't call yourself a salesperson. You're commerciale, or uh, advisor, business consultant. You have lots of uh, other words that you use, but you never say that you're a salesperson. And this was... Uh, the first thing that I learned when I moved to the United States is that they're fine. They like salespeople. It's okay to be a salesperson in the United States. And first of all, it's easy and it's much cheaper than I thought originally. Why? And I want to share with you some data here. The United States is big. It's a big country, 300 million people. Um, it has 4% of the world's population, but 26% of the world's economy. So 26% of the money that is transacted in the world is transacted in the United States. Here is just a, a physical comparison. I'm originally from Brazil, another very big country, but uh, it doesn't have as much economic power as, as uh, the United States does. So understanding how the United States works is a key factor in determining your success. So, I want to start, I wish this thing would work, because I would need to be coming here all the time, and sometimes I realize that you need to turn the thing on, and then it works. Oh, okay, genius. Okay, so, I will start with, uh, one of the things that I learned when I moved to the United States 17 years ago was there are three things that you shouldn't be able to talk about in any conversation. You don't talk about sex, you don't talk about politics, you don't talk about religion, right? You all heard that. My advice to you, if you're starting to uh, a business in the United States in the early conversations that you have, do talk about sex, do talk about politics, do talk about religion because everybody talks about it, and it's not polite, but not being polite is a good way for you to be remembered. 
But anyway, the first reason why it's great to sell in the United States is because Americans believe that they're rich. And you want to sell to rich people. Why do you want to sell to rich people? Because they have money. Uh, you know that one, there was a very popular app on the App Store that was called I Am Rich. It was $450, and there were 8,000 downloads. It cost $450, and the only thing that the app said was, I am rich. There was no functionality, there's nothing, okay? I love how smart that entrepreneur was. So this is real data. 20% of Americans believe that they are in the top 1%. This is a statistical impossibility. <laughs> but this is how uh, uh, people see themselves in the market. Once I had a conversation with a um, manufacturer who sold doors to the top 3% of the US population. He had a ton of money and he said, I have low-end doors. I sell doors to the mass market on Home Depot, Lowe's, and so on. But my profit margins on other doors just by using a, a little different wood and golden trims and things like that is like 10 times more than in the low-end market. So I need to sell less to make more money. This is something that you have to keep in mind. The second one plays to your benefit. Americans don't know geography. Uh, you all heard that. Um, and I have a personal theory. Uh, my personal theory is that because they don't play soccer, they don't play football, they don't go to the World Cup. And if you talk to a Brazilian kid in the middle of the Amazon, he can tell you what, is, what are the names of the players in the Irish team. They even know that there is a country called Ireland even because Brazil played Ireland a few times in the World Cup. Uh, but they don't know their market. And this is very important for the product that you're developing and the product that you're selling. <clears throat> One of the things that, in my experience as a consultant in, in sales with technical organizations, is that people tend to position themselves by their origin, by their nationality. So we are a great... Ukrainian technology company. We are the leading Belarusian uh, the software developers. We create apps in Estonia. They don't know. They don't know American geography. They don't know international geography. So unless your product is attached to something where the origin of your uh, development is important, don't say where you're from. It's unnecessary information. So what I say, what, what do you associate with German? BMW, engineering, right? Good engineering. So if you're a German company selling engineering services or something that has a lot of engineering, it's good to say that you're German. If you went, what? Beer. Beer, that's another thing. If you're selling beer, it's German beer, it's good. Uh, what, what do you associate with Italian? Fashion, food, what else? Cars, design. So there are lots of things that you can associate with. But would you associate software development? No. Uh, so I don't know. Position yourself. See if what you're selling aggregates value to your messaging. Otherwise, don't mention where you're from. It's like you're, you're here in Italy and you're... Uh, company from Basilicata. Does it make any difference? I don't think so, right? So if it doesn't matter, don't say it. But the most interesting point and why the United States is so attractive, it's because you can do anything you want there. Um, classic example, you Uber. Last time I was here in Italy was in February. I brought my kids for a little tour of the country and it was school vacation. And we were here in Rome, and we went, we were walking downtown, we went from Piazza Venezia down to uh, Piazza di Spagna, and we couldn't, oh, what's the name of that uh, ice cream, Giolitti, is that it, the ice cream place? So we went to Giolitti, but we couldn't move forward because all the streets around uh, the area were closed. Why? Because the taxi drivers were protesting against Uber. 
and everything was closed. And why? Because the drivers from Viterbo and other cities around town were taking Uber rides in Rome, and the taxi drivers weren't happy. And the, the mayor of the city came out in favor of the taxi drivers, and there was a lot of, of discussion around that. What we have in most economies outside the United States and China is a lot of regulations. Uh, the basic principle in, uh, where's, my, where's my law study? Uh, in traditional, in our legal systems, is that whatever, uh, you need authorization to have your activities. If your activity is not described into a law, into a, a, a regulation, it's illegal. In the United States, unless uh, there is a law saying that it, it is illegal, everything else is legal. The problem with this is that um, what is illegal in one place, you, you cannot think of the United States, especially with things related with vice. Alcohol, drugs, sex, uh, things that are usually illegal in other places, those, those tend to be regulated. It's a falsely Puritan society. So it, it, if it offends uh, some, some uh, mores and morals, it might be illegal. But, for example, you cannot, uh, I know that here uh, at Pi Campus you have the, the wine um, startup, you cannot sell wine across borders in the United States easily. So in Utah you have a monopoly of the state. If you go to New Hampshire you can buy alcohol in the supermarket, but in Massachusetts where I live you can't. So every state has different regulations. So sometimes very often I hear here in Europe, and I heard it yesterday, that one of the challenges of the single market in Europe is the different regulations among the countries. Imagine that the United States, you have essentially 50 different countries operating in some areas, okay? So you have to look at the United States as a market where you have regulated areas, finance, health, morality, and things like that, and then you have the unre unregulated market. And the, in the, the unregulated market, if it's not illegal, you can do it. This is why Uber thrives. This is why new projects, new ideas can be done there because there's no law that says I, yesterday I saw Marco's presentation about the robots that deliver food. Probably here in Italy you would need a law to say that robots can go on the street and they need to be certified and they have to be something like that. In the United States there's no law that says that no robots can go uh, alone uh, on the roads, so you try it until somebody gets killed, somebody gets hurt, and then they will have tons of laws in every city. It was the same with that um, Segway. In the beginning, everybody was excited about the Segway, and then a couple of accidents happened. It was illegal everywhere. So, uh, if it's not illegal, you can do it. The, the environment since Ronald Reagan has been completely deregulated. So it's very easy to, uh, the, the, the courts are very pro-business, not pro-employee. Um, you know what is the right of the Italian, of the American employee in a corporation? Anybody? They have one right. They have the right to shut up. <laughs> or as they would say, they have the right to shut the fuck up. Uh, because there, are, there is no labor regulations. You can be fired at will, and I think I, I talk about it. Uh, yeah, I will, maybe I'll repeat myself later. But uh, no, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk about employment later. So uh, how do you enter the U.S. market, right? What is, this is the framework. This is how you can uh, address the market. But how, what is the first step? One way of doing it is trial and error. This is how I did it. I've been in business 35 years. Uh, when I started, there, was l there wasn't information, there wasn't the internet. <laughs> it was trial and error, and you could try to develop a strategy by asking people, asking friends, and, and trying to see what worked, what didn't work. Today, you Google it, essentially. But uh, one of the things that I have found out in my experience as a consultant is that 
the best approach is for you to analyze the market and get the data, uh, statistics, information, analysis. But what I have found is that too much information is just as bad as no information at all because it takes you to this concept of analysis paralysis. You don't know what to do with that much information. You don't know how to analyze that information. And you start making wrong assumptions and you start spending a lot of money and a lot of failures happen. And I'm going to show a couple of examples of things that, that go wrong. So from experience, I'm a poor consultant. Uh, if, I had been, if I had hired experts, if I had spent a little, invested a little money up front, I would have saved a lot of time that I did with trial and error. So one of the things that I learned, hire experts. There are lots of companies that make a lot of money in providing advice. You have the big ones, the PricewaterhouseCoopers, the, the Accentures, and so on. But you also have smaller boutiques in different areas. So if you are in the, I don't know, uh, well, the presentation we had this morning here, if you, are, if you are in the food niche, there are people who are experts in, in the food market in the United States. If you are in the hospitality space, find somebody that is an expert in the hospitality space. I like to tell this story. Uh, a sister -in -law, uh, I have a sister-in-law who owns a manufacturing firm, and she makes um, car parts. And one of her biggest challenges was pricing. She said, I have a very hard time, and I don't know if I'm making money or losing money until it's too late in the process. Because we make assumptions and then the prices changes, the variables are so many that I don't know if I'm going to make money on a part that is asked by one of my clients. And, uh, and then I say, so how, how are you going to solve it? She actually came to me, I'm very excited, I'm going to do an MBA in uh, business strategy and my goal is to learn everything about pricing. It's in the best university in Brazil. I'm going to spend uh, two years learning this stuff. And, I, and tomorrow there is an info session about this MBA. And I say, do you really believe that they're going to teach you this stuff? Yeah, no, but if they knew how to do that, they wouldn't be teaching at an MBA. They would be making money out of that. And she goes there, she asks, so, Ask the professors tomorrow when you go to this open house if they can help you with your problem and uh, then you talk to me. So she went there, she talked to the guys and she comes back and said, well, they told me that they cannot help me solve my problem, but they give me the tools and the knowledge for me to solve the problem myself. So what I told her is that, who is the guy who wrote the book about pricing in your segment in the automotive industry. She immediately knew the name of the guy. I don't know, James White. Give the guy a call and ask him how much he charges for consulting. And she said, oh, do you think, look, I'm an author. The best thing in the world if somebody calls you and said they read your book. That's the best compliment you can get, right? So they, they, they read your book. You tell them how much do you charge. He probably has a consulting business. You can bring him. It's going to be much cheaper than an MBA, and it's going to be much faster. So my advice to you, find the guy who wrote the book about the topic that you're, you want to invest in and hire that guy to come and talk to you. Uh, sometimes it's going to be free. Sometimes it's going to be a cost, but it's going to be much cheaper than spending years and years trying to learn by yourself. So the other thing is that... The, <coughs> In the space of sales, there is a lot of knowledge that has been accumulated. And you can use certain tools or, or strategies that are very well known and, and, and today easy to achieve with uh, easy access to information. So one of my favorite tools is targeting. Uh, you want, and, and usually the traditional approach to targeting is called vertical targeting, which is you say, I'm going to sell to life sciences companies. I'm going to sell to wealthy individuals. I'm going to sell to, um, I don't know, uh, banks. And, and then you look at all the banks and you go into this uh, targeting approach that is the vert by vertical industry. There is another type of targeting that is called behavioral targeting. 
And we seldom talk about this in, 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 in strategy sessions where, and it's one of the things that Jamshed was talking about, you are a consumer. You have consumer behaviors. And when you uh, target, in behavioral target, what you do is you look at buying behaviors of people and you target the behaviors, not the vertical market where they are. Uh, I don't remember what is the next time. Okay, so no, let's talk a little, just a little bit more about behavioral targeting. So, if you look at McDonald's and the Trattoria down the street here, when the tower that you go to the top and you eat cacio e pepe, it's really nice. They're both in the food business, right? If you look to uh, Bank of America, the largest bank in the United States, or uh, uh, Deutsche Bank, and you look at, uh, I don't know, Casa de Risparmio di Novara, or a small bank, or something like that, they're both in the financial industry. But I probably can talk to the owner of the Trattoria, I can probably talk to the top executive at uh, uh, Casa de Risparmio di Novara. If I go to Novara, go to the restaurant where he eats, I can approach that person. Talking to the CEO of Bank of America or the CEO of McDonald's, it's a completely different challenge. And the interesting thing is that McDonald's and Bank of America are very, very similar in their behavior, buying behavior. They have procurement departments, they have procurement policies, they have uh, rules and regulations, they cannot accept bribes, they, they are not easily influenceable because they have uh, 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 manuals and procedures and, and, and things to buy. Once I, I tried to sell my services to Ford and I pro approached them and I said, I know your current vendor, I know what you're doing, and uh, looking at the way you're doing things, I believe that I can save you $2 million a year in these services. And the woman looked at me and said, my total spend in your category is $12 million. You're telling me that you can save me $2 million. That's not, that's not worth my attention because I buy $100 billion a year. That's my portfolio. $100 billion a year. Unless you can bring me savings of $100 million, I'm not interested in talking to you. So $2 million in a company like Ford, a multi-billion dollar company, is a rounding error. It doesn't appear in their decimals and their, in their financial statements. So they're not even interested in talking like that because the time it would take to get rid of their existing vendor and replacing you is not worth all the money and all the effort. So looking at the buyer behavior is very important. It's a, it's a way of you to understand who you want to sell to. You want to sell to people, you don't want to sell to companies. The other tool that you have is profiling. Profiling, I can do a full day on workshop about profiling, but profiling, especially in the United States today, is associated with a negative concept of identifying people, like black drivers are highly profiled by police and they get arrested, they get shot, and so on. So you can profile by negative bias, like uh, color, religion, uh, type of car that they drive, and so on. But in business, what matters to us when we're profiling is um, demographic characteristics and titles. The easiest way to profile a person is by their title. So uh, I love when I see the sales strategy of a company that wants to sell to the C-level executives in the Fortune 500 companies. That's the, everybody wants to do that. It must be a pain. I was a VP of marketing at a large, medium-sized company in my industry, and the number of calls that I got every day trying to sell me everything just because I was in this VP title in a certain category of companies was terrible. So these people have already a, 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 a mechanism to ignore or reject you right away. <clears throat> Uh, I, I, I usually ask my clients, so is, if everybody is focusing on the Fortune 500, who is selling to Fortune 513? That's a good company to look at, <laughs> which is the 
the, the company 1322 in the Fortune 500 list would probably be, have an economy bigger than that of Latvia or Botswana or something like that. Still bigger than a country. So keep things in mind. But what, what you want to find is that usually people with similar titles have similar behaviors and similar responsibilities. And you want to look also at the individual um, demographic of those people. So instead of profiling only on a title, I would also want to know what is the gender, what is the age range, what is the um, education level, what, and this is all information that you can scrape from LinkedIn these days. But you know what is the best way to profile your salespeople, or to profile your potential clients? Ask your project managers. Ask the people who interact with that client. I do usually some sales workshops and I, I go through this exercise. It takes about 10 minutes. We're not going to go that here. But I ask somebody, uh, who's your biggest client? So and so. What's her name? Is it a man or a woman? A woman. How old is she? Oh, I don't know. Well, she must be 40. Where does she go on vacation? Oh, she likes skiing. She goes to the beach. And how do you know all this information? Because you talk to these people every day. They put on their uh, out-of-office notices that they're going on vacation and they're going to be back on a certain day. When they're back, the first conversation that they have, how was your vacation? Where did you go? Their car broke down. Oh, what car do you have? Oh, Volkswagen, that piece of shit. I have a Volkswagen. So that's the kind of, of things that you uh, uh, get to know from talking to these people. And why is this important? Depending on the scale. If you're going to sell, this, uh, your, sell your product to a million people or thousands of people, that information is not that relevant. But if you have in a niche market where you have a hundred or fewer clients, which is usually a, a, a sweet spot of a small to medium-sized companies. Knowing your, the individual behavior of your clients can give you, win you lots of points, even in the United States. The third tool that you have is clustering, right? Uh, this is uh, a little map that I created for advertising PR and PR companies in the United States. You see that there are two big clusters. Uh, New York and Los Angeles are the big places where advertising and PR companies are, with another cluster in Chicago, San Francisco, and Minneapolis. Uh, why is clustering important? Clustering gives you, when, when you sell into a certain industry, you don't sell only to that industry. You sell to all the players in the industry. And, and a cluster exists when Several players in a certain industry concentrate, concentrate in a certain pace. If I did a map for the automotive industry, I would have a very big circle here in Detroit. But what happens? Banks that uh, sell to the automotive industry are located in Detroit. Accounting firms, that law firms, uh, advertising agencies, translation companies, uh, uh, food supply, anybody that focuses on the automotive industry has a presence in that place. So uh, if you know how your industry clusters, you can identify, this tool is very important for many things. You can find out, you can hire salespeople in the cluster, uh, right? So would I want to hire somebody in Montana to sell in New York? Probably not, right? So the cluster gives you information, geographic information on where you want to have your, your stuff. The other thing that I like to, to share here is that one of the uh, challenges that when I meant, went to the United States is that uh, I joked that Americans don't know geography, but I didn't know American geography either. And how in sales this is so important because the United States is divided in multiple regions where the Americans know. When you talk about New England, you know I live here in Massachusetts. You know that New England is this state. Uh, Maine, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and uh, New York. New York, part of New York is New England. The other part is part of the Middle Atlantic region. So <clears throat> this is very important for sales because it's how you divide your territories. You don't want to create random territories. You can create the territories based on 
the traditional distribution of the market. You can have subdivisions, but this is the generic term that people, the generic map that people have in their minds. When you talk about, uh, we're in the, the Midwest, right? Is this whole blue area. I have a theory that the Midwest is the worst place in the world to live. Because if you work in the coasts, I, I lived in New York, Massachusetts, and in California, everybody you meet, hi, my name is Susan, I'm from the Midwest. They all come from the Midwest. But uh, it's not true, it's a wonderful place to go, uh, wonderful people, they are the nicest people in the United States, they say, tell no with a smile. It's, it's cute. Um, but anyway, so it's important to, to combine clustering with territory di distribution in the United States to define a good sales strategy. There is another tool, a geographic tool, these are called MSAs, Metropolitan Statistical Areas, or also, uh, how do they call them? Micro, micro statistic areas. So, uh, there are some areas in the United States that uh, they're not towns, they're not necessarily geographic distribution. So, if you, if you talk about New York, you will hear very often about things like the tri-state area, right? Or you can go here, you have the four corners area of, of the United States. So you will have, um, uh, New York includes New Jersey uh, and uh, Southern Connecticut because that's the big statistical area. It's one business unit, essentially. Or you go to Seattle, Tacoma, and um, Issaquah and Bellevue and these are several towns but they constitute one statistical area and there is a lot of information, free information from the uh, US economic census that you can download for free that will give you a lot of economic data about industries and um, uh, metropolitan statistical areas They will give you age distribution, they will give you education levels, they will give you a lot of, of uh, consumer data also, tax collections and things like that. You can do the analysis yourselves using big data or you can hire somebody like me to do that job for you. There, I did my... This is a beautiful picture of Boston. This is uh, downtown Boston. So we, under, we, we saw what tools we have, we saw how to sell, now how do you really deploy this and transform all that information into action. So, number one mistake. This is a fr Mexican friend of mine, Times Square, New York. If you can make it there, you can make it everywhere. Bullshit. How many of you want to have an office in New York? Seriously. Yes, I know, the, uh, an honest one here. Everybody wants to have an office in New York. I wanted to have an office in New York, and I did. It's a waste of time. Okay, why New York is the, the place where, I, and I've done consulting with several companies from all over the world, and all of them say, look Renato, we're hiring you, we just opened an office in New York, we're in the United States, why did you waste money going to New York if your buyers are not there, right? Uh, what is the largest company in the United States today? In the world. No, not technology company. Walmart, right? Where is Walmart based? Arkansas. Arkansas, right? Have you ever thought of opening, have you ever been to Arkansas? The largest company in the world is, do you know where Arkansas is? Let's go back a little bit on the map here. Here. It's, 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 it's horrible. And, but, if you, if you are in the, Oh, I had music, I forgot. <laughs> so, let's stop this. So, if you can make it there, you can make it everywhere, but it's bullshit because uh, your clients are not there. Unless you are in the financial industry or advertising industry, uh, New York is not the hub for many other things. And the other thing is also Silicon Valley, right? Do you want to go to Silicon Valley? Yes, you do if you want to raise money. 
if you want to, but you can spend all the money that you raise just living there because it's so expensive. So the United States is huge. There are many hubs and many centers. You can have one of the fastest growing technology hubs in the United States. It's actually North Dakota. I don't know if you saw the movie Fargo. That's where North Dakota is. It's cold, it's horrible, but it's a very good environment for developing technology startups. The other thing for you to keep in mind when you start to open an office in the United States is that you have this concept of employment at will. You have a job because you want to have a job. I'm not, I'm the entrepreneur, I'm the business owner. I don't have, you, I don't have to give you a job. You don't have any rights. The Constitution, you don't have la legge del lavoro. You don't have uh, uh, any regulations that tell. There is only one state in the United States, and I think it's Montana, that protects you from being fired. After three months that you're in the company, you might get uh, some kind of, of compensation because you're fired. But nobody, no profession is protected. Uh, and uh, usually, if, if the company is nice and they have a nice policy, they will give you a two-week notice. They will say, you're fired and you have two weeks to get ready and transition and so on. Uh, it's very common in the United States for the factory to shut the door, people arrive there, oh, you're fired, there's no job starting today, <laughs> effective today. And like I said, you have the right to shut up and uh, be quiet and do your job. Otherwise, anybody who decides to fire you on the spot will do that. There are some soft regulations against discrimination, but uh, if you can, and, and, and the companies know how to do that very well, if you can um, wrap it around some policy, a layoff and things like that, if, you can even get rid of, of people who would be protected. Usually, um, old age, um, color, religion. One of my worst experiences in the United States is that I had to fire a pregnant woman. And uh, here, you wouldn't be able to do that. I didn't want to fire her, but my boss said, we're cutting, you have to fire her. And I said, well, but I had to fire 24 people. And I said, I'll keep her because she's pregnant. And the, my, the CEO tells me, why, why are you doing that? Well, she's pregnant. And he says, so what? Isn't it illegal? I said, well, I didn't know. He calls the general counsel, the lawyer of the company, and we have a meeting. And so Renato is saying that it's illegal to fire a pregnant woman. She was seven months pregnant. And the lawyer says, no, no, it's totally fine. There's no problem. And I was shocked because I said, well, if it's not illegal for me, it's immoral. Why would you do that, right? It's worth the worst moment for you to do that. And I said, no, she's not protected. You can fire her. Uh, is, are you firing her because she's a woman? No. Are you firing her because she is uh, of a different color or, or any of these discriminatory reasons? No. Are you firing her for performance? Her performance is not the best, but she's borderline. She's OK. OK, you can fire her. No problem. So keep that in mind. Another thing that. Uh, I learned after a while is there is this concept of a PEO. Anybody knows what a PEO stands for? Professional, professional Employment Organization. Okay? So a professional employment organization is a company that hires people for you. So you can uh, hire 20 people in the United States and not have an office there, not have a legal entity, not have anything. You hire a company to hire the people for you. So you're going to be a co-employer. This company, there are many of them in the United States, uh, this, the, the, the PEO company will take care of paying all the taxes, paying all the payroll taxes, all the uh, uh, social uh, contributions and everything that is required. You don't even have to have an office or a company in the United States to employ salespeople. I'm talking here from a sales perspective. That's my the, the, the background of the experience. So I have advised several companies. You want to hire three salespeople in the United States, don't worry about setting up, having HR, or all those things. Just hire a company like admin staff, or uh, there are several, uh, I forgot the name, several companies that do this stuff. I use them 
for my own company because I didn't want to have a, an HR department. It was a small company, 20 employees. I hired a company to take care of all the HR for us. Uh, the other thing is that I think is uh, key in opening an operation in America is PR. Your, the power of PR, public relations, is amazing. And public relations has changed dramatically in the last 20 years, in the last three years even more, uh, with di digital marketing and things like that. But print media is still very powerful. Uh, radio is very powerful. TV is still very powerful. The role of, of PR in sales has changed from creating awareness and creating an image to creating shareable content. So if you get a story on The Economist, you can share it the hell out of that on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, uh, Snap, whatever you want. And that gives authority. If The Economist wrote a story about you, if Fortune magazine wrote a story about you, if Time magazine wrote a story about you, that thing gets shared and it has authority. So PR still today is very important for getting you in front of the media that matters, right? Uh, we don't have the girls from Lecce Coigne here. Oh, there you go. <laughs> you got that, that, that experience, right? Yeah. New York Times. Uh, thanks, to Google. Thank, thanks to Google. But you got the visibility. I yeah. <laughs> but the, it's, it's beautiful because the power of PR is amazing. And then you can share that and share that. I know that for, I forgot her name. The, the, the most important thing was to show her mother to her mother that there was a picture on the Corriere de la Sera or La Repubblica or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. That's also important for your parents to understand what to do. So if you're going to invest money, before you invest in sales, invest in good PR. And that PR doesn't need to be expensive. It needs to be smart. So to recap uh, my presentation here, we want to go to the US because it's still the biggest market in the world. And, and, and you don't need a lot of money today. Uh, and you don't really need uh, major local presence to uh, start selling in the US market. Analyze the market. There is a lot of data there. Be careful because too much data can be confusing. Use experts to help you. Uh, New York is not the United States. There are lots of other uh, markets and cities that you can look into, much more affordable. Depending on the area that uh, your product is, you can even get incentives in certain markets to start your business there. Outsource HR. It's easy to hire and fire people. And invest in PR and marketing. And don't wait. How many of you wanted to jump in the pool yesterday when Jamshit invited you? <laughs> I, I did too. <laughs> But I waited and I regret it. I should have jumped into it. That's it. Thank you very much. We have three minutes if you have any questions. <laughs>